Yeah. How was the meeting? Very Liam good. Fox, what did you talk about? Secretary Fox and I have a really constructive, beneficial relationship. We've had the chance to engage now a number of times and both of us, I think it's fair to say, share big ambitions around what both Australia and the UK can do in terms of global trade as well as support for the international rules-based trading order. Yeah. Will you be signing an FTA as soon as Brexit ends? Have you, well, have, have you got pen to paper to... To pen ready to sign the paper? Well, we haven't done the agreement <laughs> yet, but it's hopefully not too long. We're yeah. certainly both of us aspirational in terms of its comprehensiveness as well as in terms of the quality of the deal. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that both of us would like to commence negotiations at the commencement of the interim period with a view to concluding it throughout that interim period and hopefully coming to entry into force, uh, you know, 1st January 2021. Yeah. From an external point of view, always good to hear external viewpoints. How do you perceive the process as going, the Brexit process? We had that big hurdle that was overcome last week, of course, the Trump provisional sure. transition deal was announced. You've got a good sort of external viewpoint. You know both sides, you know how it works. How do you think the whole... Brexit process is evolving? Well, well, I think you hit the word... I mean, you hit the nail on the head when you said evolving, because mm. clearly this is, by order of magnitude, a very significant task. So, uh, you know, I certainly know from my conversation with Secretary Fox, as well as other conversations I've had with... Uh, government ministers here in the UK that the desire is to try to bed this down as much as possible but also for the British people they don't want huge amounts of upheaval they want to know that there's an orderly process in place to facilitate this transition uh, I'm getting those messages from the UK government now clearly though uh, it is a bit of a moving feast there's two major parties to this there's the UK and then there's the EU uh, but the fact that there's more now, well, that there is now more clarity around issues such as, for example, the interim period, uh, what will happen post, uh, you know, 30 March next year, what happens come 1 January 2021, uh, just having some of these milestones in place makes a key difference. Let's talk about China, Australia, the US, possibility of tariffs. Are you caught between a rock and a hard place, US key security partner, China key trading partner? How difficult does that make Australia's place when you're stuck in between the two with potential tariffs, a tit-for-tat war underway? Well, the US is an ally. Uh, China is our major trading partner. Uh, it's not, that's not unique to Australia to have China as its major trading partner. Indeed, China is, for many countries around the world, their most important and significant two-way trade partner. Um, but Australia is also very pragmatic. Uh, we are a country that's been consistent in terms of our principles, enunciation of principles, adherence, as I said, to the rules-based order, both on trade, on you know, foreign affairs matters, um, the functioning of the UN and its various iterations and organs. I mean, this is all a key part of how Australia has been a beneficiary over many decades and will continue to be. So we'll be principle-based will be pragmatic. Um, but, you know, if you look at, again, our lived experience, Australia has successfully navigated good and strong relations with China, with Korea, with Japan, with the US. Uh, they don't always see eye to eye on issues. Indeed, even us, we don't always see eye to eye on issues, but uh, we move through it because we're committed to a mature relationship. Do you think it will spiral? I mean, Steve Mnuchin, the Treasury Secretary, is optimistic the US can reach an agreement with China to avert tariffs. Do, do you think the worst case scenario will be avoided? We certainly encourage uh, all countries to continue dialogue and this isn't just about the US and it's not just about China. Um, there is a desire from a number of countries to say well if you do this we'll do that or well, I shouldn't say desire actually let me rephrase that. Yeah, there, there has been talk mm. that if you do this we'll do that if there's this action we'll engage in this reaction. Now that's not in anybody's interests. Nobody would win from a trade war. Uh, it just costs everybody uh, if that is the prevailing uh, you know process and the world's been through this before I mean we saw post the Great Depression when there was uh, widespread action and retaliatory measures that were taken you know, the depth and the severity of the depression uh, was lengthened and we don't want to see that kind of situation arise again how is your relationship with China there are tensions there's tensions over political meddling from their side within Australia the reason why you've got these foreign interference laws China warning its students of violence against them at Australian universities. Does the increase of what we could call tensions between Australia and China, does that have negative impact on trade, investment between both sides? Well, let me pull, pull you up on the assertion in your question because you said that uh, you know, 
perceived Chinese influence in Australia was the focus of foreign interference laws. Well, that's not the case. Um, we don't want foreign interference into Australia's political landscape, regardless of who may or may not be behind it. Um, we see lots of examples around the world. I mean, we're here in the UK. Lots of examples around the world of where we see uh, other nation states attempting to have influence. Uh, and so this is not about China. This is about Australia saying we're a sovereign nation uh, and we reject uh, interference, improper interference from any country, regardless. So I think it's really important to acknowledge that right up front. But in terms of our trade and investment relationship with China, it's healthy, mm. it's strong, uh, continues to mature. From time to time we have trade irritants, as indeed any two countries do, but we work through it and we've done that repeatedly uh, over the past 24, 36 months since the China-Australia Free Trade Agreement came you're, into place. You're resisting there any big involvement in the Belt and Road Initiative. Why is that? Well, again, that's... The, I, that's not the case. Uh, Australia is, uh, we, when I was in China only last year, uh, signed up uh, to an, an MOU between Australia and China for cooperation in third countries on Belt Road initiatives. I think that there's much that the Australian business community can be involved with on Belt Road initiatives. Um, certainly infrastructure provision, its design, construction, maintenance, management, as well as project financing. These are all areas where Australia has real strength. We've got IP in the area. We've got the opportunity to draw upon a number of different um, you know, experiences that we've had and use that to good effect for our and China's benefit. Really quickly, the CPTPP, I've yes. got to put the CP not just the TPP, of course, was signed in Chile. How soon before you get the, the ratification of at least six signatories? Well, we're all hopeful that that'll happen before the end of the year. So um, there's a lot of benefits that flow from that. Um, I think that there's probably enough domestic processes underway from the 11 countries that we'll have, and we hope, uh, have been in the position for entry into force late this year. If not late this year, then certainly the first quarter of next year, we hope.